YouTube family, welcome in, YouTube friends. Smash like and subscribe as we look ahead to the Bundesliga season to come. Vamos! Well, 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 the summer is nearly over and that means more football, baby. And the Bundesliga kicks off this weekend. And I have a tremendous team to talk about the German football culture. Ian Pojo and, of course, Heath Piers. We're going to discuss regarding who are the favorites live after, of course, Erling Haaland and Robert Lewandowski, some title contenders, other European chasers, our hipster picks, Americans in Germany, because that just keeps growing and growing, our predictions, and much, much more. Quiero Lasso begins right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Quiero Lasso. Thank you so much for being part of the family. YouTube.com forward slash Quiero Lasso. We're nearly there, nearly to 20 thousand subscribers thank you so much please keep on sharing the love spreading the word Heath Pierce what's up baby how are you I'm doing good I'm excited to talk about it I threw up my uh classic Steve Trundlo shirt but it, it won't stand straight up and I'm wondering what jerseys were made of back then that make them so they're so <laughs> oddly shaped but uh here we are and there's no turning back now so I'm excited to chat Heath Pierce, always good to have you. Don't forget as well, in soccer, we trust Heath Pierce, of course, with Charlie Davis and Jimmy Conrad. And now I am very happy. You know what? A good friend, a good colleague, one of the best in the business. And it's his first time doing this. Ian Pojo, what's up, buddy? I can't believe it's taken two years for you to invite me on the show. What's going on with that? Huh? I know, that's bad. Just to get an invitation? What's up with that? I feel really mm -hmm. bad about this, Ian Pojo, because we keep going on about it. We need to have some Ian in Que Golazo, but finally we make it happen. And what a great uh, show to make it happen. Ian, I'm so happy you're here. HB, of course, both of these fine gentlemen played in Germany, so they know German culture better than most. And of course, as well as covering and analyzing, and not just from the Champions League perspective, but also Europa League and furthermore. So today, we're going to talk about the Bundesliga, baby. Let's begin straight away. Ian, let's begin with you, because obviously, baby for you, baby. I want to talk just a bit, you know, before we keep talking about Bayern and the title contenders, how do you feel about the Bundesliga now that two of the biggest stars in that market have left, Erling Haaland to Manchester City, Lewandowski to Barcelona. In fact, as we take today, this week has been what he's been saying, his goodbyes in Germany. How, how are you feeling about the beginning of the Bundesliga this weekend after those two stars coming in? Well, I'll be honest with you, and I think both of you know this, that the Bundesliga is my favorite league to follow. It's the favorite league and, and most passionate league that I follow. And for obvious reasons, having played in Germany for five years, it was uh, something very close to my heart and continued to follow the league. And even when I left, Heath was playing in the Bundesliga. It was great to see Americans playing in the Bundesliga. And even if you go back through history, all the Americans all the way back playing in the Bundesliga some of the names are just incredible who either started in Europe in Bundesliga or in Germany in general. It's always been a passion of mine. So to follow the league so intensely, it will never, ever change. This year, it's no different for me. I understand that Lewandowski leaving the Bundesliga, leaving Bayern Munich is weird. It's different. It's going to be very strange watching Bayern play with no Lewandowski. He's normally your guarantee to win another Bundesliga title. He's normally your guarantee to go and win another golden boot and certainly guaranteed to score a lot of goals. But now he's gone, somebody else needs to step up. Clearly, they've made some big signings. Um, but for the Bundesliga in general, to lose two superstars, and I mean, Haaland was a superstar. He was just next-level superstar. Then Lewandowski, I mean, the biggest name in the Bundesliga as far as I am concerned. You've lost two of the best. But the Bundesliga is not necessarily just about a league that has all the stars. That's not the Bundesliga. The Bundesliga is the league, and Heath, I'm sure you'll back me up on this one. It's the league that creates the best stars and sells them on. That's what they do right now. They make so much money in the Bundesliga. It's a great business. I'm really uh, pleased with how they've brought players into the league this year. There's some big signings, and it's certainly going to make it an interesting competition. Bayern are favorites, still favorites, and I'm really excited about that. But at some point, we've got to see a challenger in the Bundesliga Otherwise, we're going to lose interest, and I don't want that to happen. Yeah, I fully agree with you, uh, Ian. I, I, you know, when I think about this Bundesliga, yeah, you have lost two of your big stars, but that brings more attention to saying, could this be a year that Bayern don't do it? Of course, they brought in more replacements that I think uh, that, that we're going to get a chance to talk about, which could change the way in which the team plays of having, whether that's a false nine or, or, you know, Julian Nagelsmann is, has, has long loved uh, Pep Guardiola. We could be seeing something different 
uh, moving forward with Bayern Munich. But that starts the storylines of this. Could this be a year? Could this be a mix-up? And we always love Bayern Munich because they're a team, but they also have stars that can perform and, and, and lead them to, to big trophies. But in a year like this, you start to think about, is there somebody else that can slip in? And then you think about a Hol uh, a Holland leaving and, and Bruce Dortmund and what they're trying to do out of Yemi. And you also have uh, Haller once he's back and playing again. So there's the storylines that you need to kind of carry the load of losing two big players. But Ian's right. It's a team sport, especially in Germany. It's all about team orientation. You're in those locker rooms. We've both been in them. It's about the team first. And I can't say I know what it's like to be in Bayern Munich's locker room, but anywhere else in that league, it's about the team first. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how this season plays out. And we've got more storylines than ever before in terms of not just your traditional top two or top three. There's going to be a race for the top six uh, between teams that have made some really good signings this summer. Yeah, but he, if I jump ahead, in here yeah. quickly, right? Just to say a point, we want this to be a competition because we want people to stay involved in the Bundesliga and follow the Bundesliga as closely as we do. But at some point, teams need to invest more. And I think you saw that with Borussia Dortmund. They brought big players in, even though Holland left. They brought in Allaire and they brought in Ariemi. They spent money. They brought in some players on free transfers as well, Nicolas Sule. And uh, we'll go through, obviously, the transfers later on. But there was a genuine effort, and I feel like there has been a genuine effort for Dortmund at least to challenge. Leipzig trying to challenge. I mean, they've kept a hold of Nkunku, which is a, a great thing to do. But the odds don't lie. I mean, Bayern are by mile a favorite in this league, and that needs to change at some point. Otherwise, you are going to see the people who follow this league so closely from afar lose interest, start to follow the other leagues. In Germany, it doesn't matter. People don't care. They don't give a shit if it's Bayern Munich or not. They'll continue to follow Bayern if they win week in and week out. And uh, that's the way it goes in Germany. They just so passionately love their own league. Well, let's go to that segue and let's actually begin with Bayern Munich itself and the club and what it looks like under Nagelsmann in 2022 and 2023. As we remember, of course, they won last season. Uh, the record, uh, you know, to the second place Borussia Dortmund wasn't that dissimilar, although, you know, 77 points to 69 at the very end of the day means they were champions. So to both your points, Bayern is the clear leader. Lewandowski is out. However, Sadio Mane is in. And there is that much more of a focus of making him even more of a number nine, per, of course, what Nagelsmann has been talking about. But it's not just about Sadio Mane. I mean, this is a tremendous squad. De Ligt as well coming in from Juventus. So, Heath, let me just jump with you first. Bayern, 2022-2023, from everything that you guys have been talking about, let's focus on them. How high do you see them now retaining that title, right, and at the same time doing well in Europe? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, Delict, I think, is 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 a quietly, and not that it's a quiet signing because it's a massive signing, but one of the things that I was uh, so um, uh, critical of last year with Bayern over the last few years is is players like Nicolas Sule and the and the Bayern team. Fantastic player, but I've never really felt this is Bayern standard. This is a player that is going to lead them to multiple trophies because the Bundesliga is automatic, right? Uh, it's a massive failure if they don't win that. And I do think they're going to have some competition this year, but... They're always the favorites and by far the favorites. But to do what they want to do, which is leave the season with multiple trophies, I always felt that they were lacking a little bit of that leadership. So Delic, uh, I, I think, is a massive opportunity for them to own that back line, to bring a little bit of stability, which I don't think they've had the last couple of years, though they've been able to get through it on, on, on the domestic front. And then when I look beyond that, uh, you're talking about a number of, of, of quality players, Mazroy, uh, Graverberg, Graverberg, um, uh, Gravenberg, sorry, uh, coming in there. And then he's going to be competing with a Musiala who's continuing to get better and better. So if you look at the depth of the team, it's amazing. My biggest issue still comes down to where's the goal production going to come from. They've got to make up 30 plus goals this year across the board. And that means it's going to come from Gnabry. Mane is going to have to, Sané is going to have to contribute. And you can't just fill a hole like that. I get the evolution. Nagelsmann wants to evolve this into being a little bit less dependent because you can't just go and let a Lewandowski leave and think you're going to bring in a new Lewandowski. That's going to take some time. They've, they, they brought in that, the, um, the young kid, um, Till, Matthias Till, who's only 17 years old, could be the future and a star, but he's 17. Nobody knows what's going to happen with them. Barely tested at the first team level. So they're going to have to find goal production throughout this team. And, when you start to divvy that up, it becomes hard that if you have one player, maybe two players that don't have the same uh, intensity or level, we saw this with Juventus when when they when they lose uh, Ronaldo, it's hard to replace that and expect seven, uh, three or four-year players to score 10-plus goals a season. 
And that's where I'm worried about well, how is this team going to function? Not that they have to score as many goals as they did every year, but losing Lewandowski is, is clear. And the fact that they haven't brought in a not there is no like for like, but the fact that they haven't brought in somebody that they can get at least 20 plus out of uh, guaranteed is a little bit uh, worrying to me in terms of the production needed for the rest of the team. I think that's why Sadio Mane was brought in to be that guy to to score 20 plus goals. And even though he may not have been the guy to have scored most goals at Liverpool Football Club before the transfer, he's going to get more of an opportunity to be the main man at Bayern Munich. And that's probably the reason why he went there. I mean, when this was all announced, I think we all kind of went, what? Wait, what? He's leaving Liverpool to go to Bayern Munich? Like, what? Isn't that a step down? But realistically for him, it's not a step down. Because you're competing domestically to win titles every single year. You're competing in the Champions League every single year to be able to lift another trophy. And he's a guy who likes to lift trophies. Proven last year with AFCON and everything else he did, FA Cup, obviously. But he wants to win trophies right now and he wants to leave his legacy. And it's not necessarily just for him what he did in the Premier League. It's now about what he can do in the Bundesliga and in Europe. So I respect his decision to go there. You make a great point. Heath, on the defense. I mean, Bayern's defense over the last probably three years has been very, very shaky. I mean, they spent a lot of money last year bringing Upamecano into the team, tried to get things to work with Nicolas Sule. Obviously, we recognize there's a good bit of experience there when Neuer's in goal, um, but they have been suspect. And that was proven again in the German Super Cup just recently against Leipzig. I mean, 5-3. It's like a friendly result. 5-3 in a Super Cup game. But that's what Bayern Munich are right now. You score three, we'll score four. If you score four, we'll score more. That's who Bayern Munich are right now. They're a dangerous side. They like to uh, score goals. Thomas Muller continuously uh, gets better. He's been given a second life at Bayern. Obviously, we understood that he was potentially out the door a couple of years ago. Um, but I think now there's a, a little bit more consistency with his experience there. The guy continues to produce with assists. And they've got some good youngsters. You mentioned Musiala, obviously. But they've got some good youngsters. They continue to spend on young players to try and bring them to the club if they don't have them in their ranks. Bayern Munich's a business. They're willing to sell players, proven with the American Chris Richards going to the Premier League from Bayern recently for a large sum. They make money and they're not frightened to now also spend money because they know they need to compete on the European level as much as they need to compete domestically. And I think Sadio Mane, who is the favorite right now this season to win the Golden Boot, will win the Golden Boot. And I think he gets 25 plus this year. All right, so that was the main contender, obviously the main contender to win the whole thing once again and retain the title in Bayern Munich. But Ian, let's jump with you on HP. You jump in, but let's talk about the main contenders for the title. Uh, Runner-up last season as well, Borussia Dortmund. Of course, Erlen Haaland, we talked about his exit and his arrival to Manchester City as well. Alex Witzel as well, he left as well, and some others. But, you know, arrivals, including you mentioned Ian Adeyemi, Haller. We have to mention, by the way, about uh, the testicular uh, tumor that's happening and he's going through chemotherapy. We wish him nothing but the best. And obviously we have to wait and see what happens there. But Ian, what do you make of the contenders to Bayern Munich, you know, specifically with Dortmund and Leipzig? Yeah, listen, Borussia Dortmund's been a bit of a mess recently. Um, I'll tell you a personal story. I sat down with Joachim Watzke, uh, CEO of Borussia Dortmund, about four years ago. And I actually asked him straight out, when are you finally going to challenge Bayern Munich for a title? Because right now, you're not even playing tennis. You're just letting them serve the ball at you and let them win points day after day. It doesn't yeah. work like that in the Bundesliga. We need something. We need someone to step up and challenge. And he said, we want to challenge right now. But please don't forget, Ian, we're also a business. We're making a lot of money. Okay, great. Thanks very much. We'll just continue to give you all our money, turn up every single game to the Westfalen Stadion, and watch you lose games against Bayern Munich in the Klassiker. No, thanks. I'm not interested in that anymore. I'm waiting for a challenger, and I want it to be Borussia Dortmund. Not only because they're fair on the Americans, they give youngsters an opportunity to play, and they've got one of the best youngsters in the world game right now in Jude Bellingham, but I think they've made some shrewd signings. When you lose Holland, you've lost a killer, right? I mean, that guy, in my opinion will be the best number nine in the world, if not this year, very soon. And he's not far away already as such a young player. He's brilliant, but you've now lost him. You've sold him on. It was a strange deal, whatever. But I think what they did bring in Sebastian Allaire in was a great piece of business. And had Allaire not gone through this misfortune of the cancer, and, and like you said, we, we, we can only support him because there are things that are so much bigger than football, and that is the player's health. Um, but it's a shame for Dortmund because he could have been the difference between them really being a contender 
and hopefully being a contender because he is a killer. And he's proven in the Bundesliga with what he did at Eintracht Frankfurt. Um, disappointing, obviously, with what he did at West Ham, but finally found his form again and, and made the move to Borussia Dortmund. So I respect him. Um, but Ariemi's going to have to step up there. We, we know Mukoko, the youngster, has had a lot of pressure on his shoulders, but he's also going to be another one who will step up. And Daniel Malin, I think, will be better than he has been in the last season. Um, but they made some good signings in the defence. They had to because their defence was really poor. Goalkeeper obviously came in last year and let in a ton of goals, but I don't blame the goalkeeper. I think their centre-backs and full-backs were very, very sloppy. They brought in a really good player, Nico Schlotterback. He came in, I think he was at Freiburg before, fabulous footballer, I've spent a bit of money on him. And then they brought in a free transfer in Nicola Zuli, which was announced in December last year or January last year. So experience comes along that back line as well. Is it enough? I don't know. I mean, we don't, we really don't know who Borussia Dortmund are. They now once again have gone back to Eden Terzic as their head coach. So we're kind of hoping that they could be the Borussia Dortmund. But good news coming out of their camp is that Gio Reyna is back fit again. He played recently in a game against Antalya Spor, I believe and um, played 45 minutes. So it's good to see that he's coming back. But I just think Borussia Dortmund at some time, at some point, need to prove something to their supporters that they can be a challenger and they care. They want a challenge. Yeah, I agree. And, and the, 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 the only thing I would add a few points to, to a couple of those teams, obviously, I, I think that the Sule, uh, Sule and Schlotterbeck give some patience to Mats Hummels not having to play all the time. They were Dortmund are slow. They've been slow in the back line. Mats Hummels is slow. Fantastic player, legendary player. But the way in which Dortmund want to play with the speed and the youth that they have, they need some of these players like Schlutter, Schlutterbeck, who's a little bit on the younger side. Sula can slot in and, and, and play a role as well. Now, when I think about uh, another team that has a chance for contending, just in terms of their ambition, I think about Bayer Leverkusen. They are, have been known as Lever, uh, Neverkusen because of their lack of trophies. <laughs> and generally, they were the first one in Germany that was part of developing young players and selling them on. If you go back into their history, they were the first one that was really doing that. And, you know, for an American context, Landon Donovan was a player that came in as, as a young player for, for, for those that don't know. They kept their players. They've still got Diaby there. Florian Verts, they signed to a new deal. Yes, he's still coming back from his knee injury, but he's a player that shows their ambition, right? It would have been easy to move him on. Yes, he's injured, but easy to move him on uh, knowing the kind of money that they could get for a player like him. But that ambition, I think, and, and Patrick Schick signs a new deal, and he was finished second in the Bundesliga in terms of goals, yes, uh, our, our boy Holland was, was injured for, for, for some of the season last year. And, and that skews the numbers a little bit, but a fantastic player. So Leverkusen's another, another one that I think is, uh, could be not necessarily a title challenger, but taking points that creates a little bit of that title challenge for those top few teams. Having said that they lost in the cup already, uh, to, uh, a team I hadn't heard of. Maybe you have heard of them, Ian Elver, Elvers, uh, Berg, I believe they're yep. called or Elvensburg or something like that. They lost in the cup already, which. It's a little bit of a of a setback, but sometimes when you look later on in the season to get that out of the way, it could be a, a thing that you focus on less and uh, focus on the things that matter more. But Le Leverkusen's one that I think are at least showing some ambition when it would have been easy after the season, finishing uh, third in the in the Bundesliga to sell a bunch of players on and say, look at this model. We're a Champions League club and we move players on. You know, look how great this is. But instead, it seems like they have a little bit of ambition to challenge for something in the next year or two. Listen, I can't wait to give you my top four, Heath, because it might disappoint you with Liverpool. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That's fair. Well, that's fair. Well, it, it's coming, boys. Don't you worry. It's coming. Listen, we didn't... Uh, and by the way, as we are taping, everybody, Gio Simeone, Diego Simeone's son, uh, reportedly uh, looking like he might make a switch to Borussia Dortmund to ail a little bit of that Haller absence as well. We'll have to see how that works out. But very quickly, HP and then Ian jump in on uh, Leipzig because Leipzig obviously as well have to try and see how they can figure this out in the top four. Tyler Adams has led for Leeds United. As so as others as well. He Chan Kwang as well making his move. Uh, Mukiele as well. Uh, and also we're hearing maybe, maybe Timo Werner might go from Chelsea uh, to Leipzig. HGB, just give me your, your thoughts on RB Leipzig and their chances on maybe making a little bit of a nightmare for Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund. Yeah, I think Ian made a good point already. Just the ability to keep Nkunku is a, is a massive win for, for Leipzig. They brought in Zava Schlager to replace Tyler Adams, which I think is a pretty like-for-like -like one. I don't think that there's any issue with them replacing Tyler Adams, at least in the role that he was playing in the last six to eight months at the club. And then David Raum coming over from, from Hoffenheim as well. Another left player could play left midfield, left fullback. But a German a bit of money international brings a, yeah. a little bit of that experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this team has a lot of those pieces, but in terms of challenging for a title, I don't really see that. 
I do think that they are a Champions League club. They have the ability to swap a Champions League quality player for another one when they leave or or, or exit or sell. But that's uh, that's a team that I I do think will be uh, challenging for for Champions League spot. But I just I don't know. Maybe Ian, you feel differently, but I don't really see a, a title contender in RB Leipzig. Having said that, you go back a few years and you looked at the players on the field, and most of those players emerged in those seasons where they were challenging for a top two. And that's what you get with that youth is you put a lot of at risk because of that inconsistency. But we might see uh, something special out of this team uh, for this year that perhaps we were underperforming in, in seasons past. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that they're kind of also runs Leipzig and we're waiting for them to find out exactly who they are. They've had a decent run recently in the Champions League. Um, domestically, I thought they were pretty poor last year and, and really inconsistent with their decision making. I thought uh, executive wise, they made some really poor choices with who they put in charge and firing, uh, obviously, Jesse Marsh. I mean, strange timings on everything. Um, but I think that Leipzig will be better this year than they were last year. How good? I guess that will be determined pretty quickly. Um, if they make a Timo Werner signing, as you mentioned, LME, that's a hell of a signing. If you can bring him in or back to the club, I mean, that guy is so familiar with their system, so familiar with how they like to play. The fans love him. He'd fit in perfectly. I don't see it happening, but anything can happen in this game. Um, there was one other that we, we didn't really touch upon there. Uh, you mentioned David Raum coming into the team. Now, David Raum is, a, is a, in my opinion, is a good left back. He can play in left midfield, as you mentioned, Heath. But that puts me into consideration that Angelino might be on his way out the door, by the way. And I heard a rumor that he was potentially going to Hoffenheim, which makes absolutely zero sense. Well, Ian, Barcelona are reportedly interested as well. So you don't know where he might, which is, you know, once again, we don't know where this money's coming from. But apparently, yeah, that's Barca, where he go. Hoffenheim, <laughs> I mean, bit of a difference in uh, a choice right there. I'm yeah, sure yeah. he was offered to Barcelona, but whether or not he actually plays at Barcelona, I think he could be because he's a talented player and he's. Yeah. The point wanted. is, he's wanted by clubs right so there's a chance yeah. that maybe he leaves the club yeah yeah he may be leave the club and and that's why i was a bit surprised i think it was what 26 million or something like that mm. they spent on rom coming in yeah. um in kunku signing a, an extension is massive for them tedesco being in charge of this team and having consistency with this team is massive for leipzig I, I, I'm not a fan of obviously the system. Heath obviously knows when you have the 50 plus one and then you see a club like Leipzig and Hoffenheim who have ownership and can spend money. I'm not always a fan of that because I feel like it's just a, a, affecting the game in Germany a little bit. But you cannot uh, not admire what Leipzig have done, um, especially in European competition. I think that held them back a little bit last year. European competition, failure, obviously disappointment, lacking confidence, lack of fitness. This year, I think you'll see a different Leipzig. But I just I don't see them being able to compete with Bayern Munich. But if they get lucky, like we saw in the Super Cup there, they can certainly score goals against teams like that. Well, it'll be interesting to see how you two boys decide to pick what your top four is going to be. We're going to take a break here. Okay, well, that's a Bundesliga preview. Ian Pojo, Heath Pierce. when we come back, our top four. We'll also talk a little bit about the European expectations for these German sites. I mean, there is a winner already from last season in Eintracht Frankfurt. Our hipster picks, Americans in Germany, full-on predictions and much more. Okay, well, so we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Kigo Lasso. LME here, HP, and of course, Ian Poe. Joy. All right, Ian, let's start with you. You said that you were going to surprise a few people with your top four. So before we talk about just, you know, German expectation in Europe, let's just quickly, what, what are you thinking top four wise? All right. Well, I think Bayern Munich are clear favorites. I think they're like minus 500 to win. So why, why, why <laughs> so put money on leave it? Leave that away, right? Yeah, you're not even, even going to go near that one there. Um, if there's a challenger, I think it comes from Dortmund and Leipzig. We've touched upon it there. I think two of those clubs will be better. I like Eden Terzic. I like Tedesco. I used to hate Tedesco, but I do like him now and what he's doing at Leipzig. I think they've got consistency there. I love the Nkunku signing. So that tells me that they're serious about doing some damage in the top four this year. So I have Bayern Munich, I have Borussia Dortmund, I have Leipzig. Leipzig and Dortmund could swap there. So I really think Leipzig will be better this year, but neither of those two teams will challenge. Now get this one. Challenging for a Champions League place is always going to be difficult in the Bundesliga because of such competition. Leverkusen are the favourites, and I absolutely agree with you there, Heath, on that. No doubt about it. But I'm going for Borussia Mönchengladbach to have a great Ooh, season this year. Baby. 
I am. And I do like their new coach, Farke. Obviously, we recognize where he came from in the Premier League. Um, he's familiar with the Bundesliga, obviously, being a German. Um, but I just, there's something about Borussia Mönchengladbach. I watched him at the weekend in the German Cup game uh, just to watch Joe Scali, who played very well, by the way, and also scored in that game. And they looked pretty good. And I get it. Heath, you've played in the German Cup. I've played in the German Cup. And you play in these early, early rounds. You play against sometimes hopeless teams. But there's also these tricky games that you come up against. They made it look easy. Formation-wise, team-wise, players on the bench, they're stacked, Gladbach. They underperformed last year. Real Mbolo is gone. He went to Monaco, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I, they still have a great deal of experience. And um, I think that Gladbach could get it right this year to just squeeze into the top four. So they're my surprise pick. Well, Ian, defensively, they're going to have to figure things out because they ended 10th last season and they conceded 61 goals. So I guess that's going to be a major talking point for them. But it's a good one. HP, what do you have for me? Oh, man, now he's making me nervous. So I've got, I've got the same top three. Uh, Leverkusen for me is an interesting one because if Florian Verts takes longer, you could he could be out for for a longer period, and he's just set, such a catalyst for this team. Uh, I could see them. Sw I could see RB Leipzig or Bayer Leverkusen being that three, but I'll give a sleeper pick for my fourth. Uh, just just for the for the conversation. Now Eintracht Frankfurt's one that that I think could have a better season this year, coming off of this Europa League title. I think it was a massive moment for them. What I'm worried about is, is whether or not Philip Kostic stays. If he stays, I've got them as my, my top four pick just in terms of their ability to go out and get players. And what I liked about uh, their offseason is they lost six, seven players like, like, like most teams do that don't make the headlines that are either surplus requirements, out of contract, things like that. But they went and shopped around Europe outside of the Bundesliga, bringing in a number of players, Alidu, Buta, Moani, Ongain, Smolcic. Most of these players you wouldn't have heard of because they're not shopping within the league. But I think that confidence that they have also bringing in Gregorich, who was the top scorer at Augsburg this last year as sort of a midfielder striker, I think could, uh, and Gotze, by the way, from, from, from PSV, which is a great experience signing. So that's a team that, if they can put all the pieces together, uh, could challenge. I like the Gladbach shout. The thing about Farke, though, is that he likes possession-based football. Obviously, this team was a little bit scattered last season. To transition into that requires a buy-in. How long that takes before them they become a very good possession-based team uh, could be the difference of them finishing top four, at least in my opinion, Ian. But that would be my my sleeper. Obviously, Eintracht Frankfurt, great the year before, average in the league as they were on their European run. Uh, but that's a team that I think could could uh, slip in. And by the way, real quick on 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 uh, uh, two teams that just changed everything for the Bundesliga this year. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, Werder Bremen back in and Schalke back into the league. Two teams that, if, if you know the history of the Bundesliga, are absolutely massive clubs that aren't <laughs> going to come in with just maybe their first goal is survive. But when you talk about the goals they had, both of them had 40 goals between uh, the two strikers at, at uh, I believe it was Bremen. Schalke had the, the, uh, the uh, golden boot winner with 30 goals in the second Bundesliga. If that translates, that could shift a number yeah. of teams, one, two positions, higher or lower, that you could find a few teams that we thought would be safe or mid-table fighting relegation for a lot of the year. Yeah, listen, I, I think you, you have to recognize those clubs are huge, right? And we don't see them probably getting relegated because of the stature of their clubs. Uh, real quickly on your Gladbach one, we must not forget there's a lot of teams who are in European competition. And uh, you've got to think that teams who are not in European competition will be focused definitely on what they can do domestically. And it's, it, it was proven last year with Eintracht Frankfurt, right? They were shocking in the Bundesliga. And yeah. I mean shocking. Yeah. But in Europe, they looked like Barcelona. Oh, yeah, by the way, they actually played well against Barcelona. They barcelona Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> they absolutely destroyed them. No, it's a very, very good point. With that being said, Ian, uh, let's jump to you, and then HP, you jump in again. Let's do our hipster picks, baby. Those sexy undercurrent stories that we're not really listening about yet. You're maybe a team, a player, a storyline to watch out for for the season ahead. What do you have, Ian? Well, I mean, hipster picks is always very difficult because the Bundesliga is so unpredictable, as Heath will tell you. Playing in the Bundesliga, you never know what kind of season you're going to have. You could be challenging for Europe or you could be going for relegation. Um, I love the two picks that Heath just mentioned right there, Schalke and Werder Bremen, because of how big those clubs are. But keep an eye out on Freiburg. Freiburg are a team for me that um, have an amazing coach. They have an amazing history. They have an awesome new stadium. They've been going through a transitional period where they're bringing some experienced players to the club. Freiburg are a team that I think, and they have 
really recently, as we know, it's making it all the way to the German Cup final last year. They're a team that could potentially push into the top six and stay there. Very, very good last season. I think they could be a sleeper pick for a potentially, and, and don't, don't just hate me, don't hate me for this, potentially sneaking into the top four as well. So if there's a hipster pick, it is absolutely Freiburg because it's such a cool club and they are an absolute sleeper to make the Champions League next year. They're doing things the right way on and off the field. I love it. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I got uh, a little confused before. I just wanted to point out that it, it was uh, Lucas Alario that, that had come into Eintracht Frankfurt, not Gregoric. He went to actually Freiburg to, to See, add to, I lo- to I their love it when ability. So I wanted to make sure because that, that makes it so much it, easier for everybody well, you, else. You know, I'm a runaway train at times and I say words and then I go like, whatever I just said didn't feel feel right in my gut. And at least I can uh, go back and, and double check that. But yeah, the, the hipster teams for me were not so much the hipster teams as, as, as Ian said, because it's really hard to presume or, 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 or think that a team can really exceed expectations because there's such a structure uh, there that you just don't know who's going to be the, 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 the like a, who you're going to put a flyer on. But the Schalke... And, and the Vitter Bremen ones were really what I was trying to get to with those sleeper picks in, in that uh, Dukesh and Nicholas Fulkrug had 30, no, 39 goals between them in the second Bundesliga last year. And then yep. Simon Terada at, at Schalke had 30 goals. And so I, I think it's Terada who's been like the four-time golden boot winner in the second Bundesliga before. I, I believe it was him when I was doing the research. Has, is the most, has scored the most goals in the second Bundesliga. Eventually, yes. that's got to translate. There is. It's a gap and a difference of style of play, as as Ian knows. Like the more you go up, the, the game changes. I actually felt it was a lot easier to play in the Bundesliga than second Bundesliga, just because of the speed of play. You had more timing; teams respected you more. Second Bundesliga adds a little bit more fight, a little more grit to it, you know. And and, and it's a challenge, but to be able to get goals at that level, I think has to translate. So if one of those teams can get a goal production season out of one, one of the three of them has a great season, then uh, that could be somebody that at least I think disrupts the Bundesliga a little bit, as opposed to. The, the, the idea, again, as I said before, of just getting up and staying up. Uh, those g- clubs are too big to have that little of ambition. Hey, Heath, let me tell you a quick story. When I was at St. Pauli, and um, obviously I was going through some crap off the field and my mental health was struggling. And, and sometimes you doubt yourself as a player, as an athlete. I think you sometimes doubt yourself and mentally you're trying to think, you know, how good really am I? I remember going into my boss. I was in the second Bundesliga and I was looking around at other clubs and I was at one of the coolest clubs in the world, right? St. Pauli. And everything was amazing. 25,000 every game. I was so, you know, I was playing 90% of the time. I went into the, the gaffer's office and I said, listen, we're, we're playing well this season. Like we could go up here and I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure I'm good enough to play in the first Bundesliga. And, he, and he, his reaction, I'll never forget. He's like, Ian, you're a better footballer player than I ever was. And I played 250 games in the first Bundesliga. In many ways, it's easier than playing in the hell that is the second Bundesliga. Because the second Bundesliga is very close to the English Championship. Yeah, I was just going to say. It's I was a just blood say, Yeah, I, mean, I was like just going to say. War. It's crazy. I think when you right. separate it, yeah. When you separate a top division to anything that's lower, what you lack maybe in technique, you make up in things that are intangibles, and that's the physical aspect of things, whatever. And that's a, a great story, and which actually directs me to my next point, which is about how young Americans have adapted to the German game as well. And now we're getting very excited because obviously Giorena seems fitter, of course. Uh, Scali to talk about as well. PFOC as well. Ricardo Pepe as well. I know Heath Pierce will have a lot to say about that one. So tell me, guys, Americans in Germany, what are you looking for? What are you excited about? HP, let's start with you. Oh, man. I mean, Joe Scali, I worry about time because uh, Stefan Lehner, if he plays all the time. But Joe Scali has that versatility. He can play in a number of positions. I think he'll continue to get matches as a young player and develop. Uh, I don't think that bodes well in terms of his chances for the World Cup and that consistency. If he doesn't get that run of games, he might it might be a little bit too late and he'll be looking towards 2026 to get minutes. Ricardo Pepe, as I mentioned before, when I had the Gregorich uh, transfer news wrong and then corrected, uh, now finds a little bit more position on the field. Gregorich is a little bit of a withdrawn striker midfielder, but if they play with two strikers like they did a lot last year, that could give Ricardo Pepe, and that's just going to be about confidence and form. He had nice... In, in the cup, had a nice little through ball that set up one of their goals. Again, one of those ones that was on the easier side, a comfortable win for them, but I need him to really, really uh, round into form. And then PFOC, that's, that's the, for me, uh, outside of the, the obvious Gio Reyna storyline is, is how 
functional can he be in the Bundesliga to score? Obviously scored also in, 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 in the cup, a fantastic goal. But how functional can he be in terms of a versatility player that translates to the national team? He obviously makes a big transfer, scored consistently. And, and every time there was a hater, continue to score all last season. If he can translate that to, to Union Berlin this year, I think there is a case for him to at least be on uh, the, the plane to, to Qatar, knowing that there's 26 players. And then from there, who knows? Even though, you know, Greg Berhalter doesn't seem to like anyone but Ferreira right now. Um, <laughs> and then his, his obvious love for, for, for Pepe. You can make yourself indispensable with your performances in this first half of the season. And I think he's primed and put into a great spot considering the, the amount of money that they paid for him. Uh, the time that he spent in the team in preseason, there seems to be a trust in what he is going to have to do. Now he's going to have to like prove that transfer right. Hey, Heath, can you just clear something up for me? Is it PFOG or Sabertooth? Because in Germany, they're saying uh, Apparently, he's Sabertooth again. Yeah, it's Sabertooth again. Oh, so he's, he oh, went to so he's back to Sabertooth now. Then. He's okay. Sabertooth he, in he, Germany, yeah. He announced himself on Union Berlin's like Twitter uh, as Jordan Sabertooth, and I oh, thought, like, wait, wait a minute. Didn't we go through this whole, like, apologies, yeah. Then. Sabertooth, he's on the run from apologies. someone. He's on the run. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's on. He's that's doing, he's that's some Shakira, to... Shakira tax evasion, you know, <laughs> just changing his name. Man. Hey, was, was he playing in Switzerland or where was he? Was Swiss, well, now, yeah, he wasn't paying well, any now that, Exactly. Yeah. Now that explains it. Ian, what do you have? Americans in uh, Germany. What are your storylines? Because it's a World Cup year as well. So it's very massive important year. to start well. Yeah, massive year. I mean, health is going to be of importance for all of these players, Gio Reyna in particular. If he's healthy, he's one of the best players at Borussia Dortmund, which tells me that he's one of the best players that the U.S. national team has. Yeah. So if he's healthy, um, he can be a real impact in the World Cup. And he can be a tremendous impact for Borussia Dortmund and how successful they can be. I heard rumors about um, Gio. Obviously, Dortmund are frustrated with his injuries. Um, I heard rumors potentially of him being shopped around a little bit. I don't believe the rumors. I think they love the kid. I think they're going to give him another chance. And he was very good for Aiden Terzic before. I think he'll be good for Terzic again. He just needs to stay healthy. Well, they were the ones, by the way, Ian, they were saying we found the solution. They were the ones saying, like, we found the problem. Yes. And we fixed the problem. Then he got hurt again. That was on them. They need to take, <laughs> well, that was take problem, one on the chip for that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's the pressure they put on the kid, right? I mean, rushing him back too quickly when he, maybe he didn't want to come back. And he's also pushing himself back because he feels the pressure from the media. I mean, it's a lot of BS, right? You're in, uh, reading the German Zeitung there and that saying, hey, we, we found the hero. This is the guy who can save our football club. And all of a sudden, he's pushing himself back too quickly. And you could see the tears and uh, agony he was going through. We don't need that anymore. This is he, he cannot afford another hamstring injury. If he has another hamstring injury, how close we are to the World Cup, it's really putting his uh, place uh, from being an impact at the World Cup. I think he'll be on the plane, but I think his impact at the World Cup will be determined by how healthy he is at Dortmund. Uh, Joe Scali, great. Spoke to him at the weekend as well, actually. Um, he is a, a player who's on the outside looking in for the national team right now. The only way to get in is to play regularly at Gladbach. Started off fantastic last year, obviously making your debut against Bayern Munich and Lewandowski in 21. And then, you know, as you get to the end of the season, you're a bit part player. That's frustrating. But I think he can uh, he can be still impactful for Gladbach. He is well liked at the club, including Adi Huda. They like him a lot. So they, they see that he could be someone really important for them. Um, but I always find that with teams like Gladbach, when things are going well, you're going to see kids like him getting a chance to play regularly. But when they're not going well, I think we've all been there. You kind of see the experienced guys getting thrown back into the 11. So that will be determined on results and performances. He's got a chance, though. I really believe that. Uh, P. Falk, Tough one. Union Berlin have done so well recently. I've got a feeling they're going to struggle this year, Union Berlin. And I think PFOC will he will be key to their success. If he scores goals, they'll be in the top half of the table fighting for Europe again. If he doesn't, um, then they're going to be in trouble. And uh, he, his potential place at a World Cup is going to be at stake as well. And then Pepe, I mean, this is just a big talking point, right? The guy failed already. But he's such a young kid and such a talented youngster. He is key to them staying up this year because I've got Augsburg flirting with relegation. So it's up to him. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the very beginning of this Bundesliga season is going to be very important for all the players, but specifically, obviously, USMNT faithfuls, including, of course, Giorena, who is my tip. You know, when he's fit, oh, man, he's just so electric. All right, let's wrap this up. It's been a tremendous episode. And, of course, we knew it was going to be so good. All right, we've talked about predictions a little bit regarding the top four and stuff. But let's just go into the winner Perhaps, I mean, it's a no-brainer, right? It's Bayern Munich, right, Ian Porger? I mean, we don't have to go, we don't have to do an essay about this. It's Bayern Munich. 
yeah, no other comment. Bayern Munich. Yeah, HP? Had Hilaire been there from the start, I thought there'd be a challenger. He's not, so I'm saying Bayern Munich, clear, clear favorite. All right, three for three in Bayern Munich. We've talked about our top four, by the way. Let's talk about the golden boot. Let's talk about top goal scorer, by the way. And by the way, obviously, as we are taping, there's some names and maybe coming into the Bundesliga as well that we haven't discussed. But right now, as we're talking, HP, if I'm, if I'm asking you for your top goal scorer, who's that? Sadio Mane, again, because of Haller. He, I think he could have challenged for that as well. But I want it to be 30. Give me 30, you know? Give me 30. <laughs> Arrive and well, be a star. They're, they're making him a proper nine, in, And you said Sadio Mane already. He's going to score a lot of goals. Is he your golden boot? Yeah, he's he's definitely the favorite. But I think Christopher Nkunku could be very close this year to actually stealing that golden boot away. I don't think there'll be a goal scorer in the 30s this year because Lewandowski's gone and Allaire's not fit. Had Allaire been there, he would have been my prediction. Yeah. Yeah, no, good call. Good call on Kunku. Let's go. All right, let's talk about the dreaded relegation. All right, uh, we've talked about a little bit about those teams that have come up, all right, the Verde Bremens, et cetera. Ian, who's getting relegated? Um, Bochum, for me, are the definites to go down. I don't fancy them. They haven't spent much money. Um, they surprised a few uh, teams last year, obviously, against Bayern Munich. They had a great result last year, which was terrific. But Bochum, for me, just too little, too late. And as Heath pointed out earlier on, these giants that have come up into the Bundesliga this year, I just don't see Bremen and Schalke getting relegated. I just don't see it happening. Um, I think Cologne could be a struggle this year. Many people have had them tipped to be in the top half of the table and pushing for Europe. I think they struggle this year. They've, they're a team that are up and down over the years, and I think this year could be one for them to struggle. Mainz will struggle this year. But one, the other one that I'm almost certain that will go down this year is Augsburg. I just don't fancy them at all. I think they're getting things wrong on the field, spending too much money on the wrong player. Pepe, a lot of money spent on him, didn't produce immediately. Um, I think that Augsburg are in a lot of trouble unless the American saves them. Ooh man, I, now I'm I'm under I'm feeling a little bit of pressure of, of who's going down for me. Actually, I think I think Stuttgart, which which I hate to say for for Materazzo, but I, I think Stuttgart are going to be one that struggles. They haven't really brought in the replacements. I don't see the team making some big leaps and bounds this year, which they were already flirting with 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 relegation. So I'm going to say Stuttgart and then uh, Bochum are my two teams. Again, that relegation playoff spot is really hard to to say who goes up, who goes down, and could slot in there. I think Ian had some really great points around teams that could struggle and be flirting there. And Augsburg's one that if Ricardo Pepe doesn't become the star that we want him to selfishly, I think they're going to struggle as well and be flirting with disaster. Which for a young player, that's not a striker. Great situation to learn from. Ian and I have both been in situations that are tough like that. You learn a lot about yourself and team and competing and that sort of stuff in those situations. But when you don't have that, when you're a striker, not a great situation to be in. So I could see Augsburg going down as well. Well, his teammate, George Sargent, can definitely tell you a little bit about that as well. And by the way, last season... Hey, he was Bochum... the top scorer at Bremen. He was the top scorer at Bremen. They, you know, that's not his I, fault. I, I, it was only seven goals, but it was I, him I, the top relegated. I, I was <laughs> Exactly. And I was sneakily also talking about Norwich as well. But let's last season, by the way, Bochum in the 13th with 42 points. Augsburg with 38. And Stuttgart with the skin of their teeth on 33 points just on goal difference as well. So we'll have to wait and see. All right, well, that was it. Heath Pierce from Insoka, we trust. Thank you, Ian. Killer joy. It's been such a joy. Before we go, we always do final thoughts. It doesn't even have to be about the Bundesliga. It can be a bit whatever you want. Ian, since this is your debut, and I'm sure it's first of many, because we're going to make sure that you come back more and more and more. We'll talk about uh, that with Des Norris. But Ian, give me your final thoughts before we say goodbye. Well, I just want to say thanks for having me on the show finally. I know it took two years to get that invitation, <laughs> but thanks for having me. I'm still waiting for the invitation from Heath Pierce and the gang over at the state. You know oh, what I mean? You I want, know what? Uh, me too as well, actually. And so still, still waiting for that invitation, but I guess it's in the mail somewhere. No, listen, I'm proud of both of you boys. I'm, I'm so happy uh, to be a part of uh, our, our CBS crew and um, what you guys have done. Um, I, I just love you guys as human beings and to see good, good people doing well and being successful makes me very happy and warms my heart but isn't it so great to see football back and i mean like i'm obviously involved in mls which i love but european football there's just nothing like it and you're just tasting it with these super cup games and scottish league started last week we've got the english league starting the german league starting we're close to the italian league starting it just feels so goddamn good to be back Preach, brother. I preach. I totally HP, final thoughts, totally brother. Hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, leave it at that. Obviously, it's great to see us kind of 
fill up that piggy bank enough to get Ian to come on finally after a couple of years. But, uh, you know, uh, I thought maybe he'd wear that to NYCFC ring on the show, but it looks like oh, yeah, maybe that's, that's why we haven't right. seen his hands because it's pretty heavy to, to lift up his arm when he's wearing that thing. But uh, uh, it was a great, it was a great, great, great episode. Great to see you guys. I'm so excited for, as, as Ian said, football to be back, man. It felt like such a long summer that, uh, that, uh, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy too, brother. I'm happy too. Heath Pierce from Misaki. Trust me, make sure you check him out. And by the way, if you haven't seen that beautiful ring, make sure you, I don't know. Ian, is it next to you? Otherwise, it could just go on your social media accounts, right? It, it's, it's, in it's, it's in the safe. It's in the safe, locked away. Yeah. It's in the safe, <laughs> locked away. Absolutely beautiful. Well, I want to thank HP, Ian, as well, for being part of the show today. By the way, thanks so much for listening to Kego Lasso. Please take a minute to nominate us for Best Sports Podcast in the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Link in the description. We're on Apple Pods, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your pods. We're also available as video. As you know, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube and visit YouTube. Help us to get to 20,000 subscribers. Ian, by the way, you can watch him on HQ as well. And HP, I already mentioned the pod, but there's so much more to come from Kego Lasso, CBS Sports, Bundesliga is coming up, baby. And just like Ian said, football is back. And so are we. We'll see you next time. Till then.